Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, welcome to Gardening on a Budget. Um, I want to say thanks to our sponsors, Solid Waste Management District, St. Louis Jefferson County, as well as Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Tonight we have Crystal Stevens um, from Flourish, as well as Tend and Flourish School of Botanicals, um, joining us for Gardening on a Budget. Um, this is part of our Reduce, Reuse, Recycle series of virtual programs. Um, so tonight we're gonna be learning about reducing your food waste, um, as well as reducing um, our carbon footprint and packaging by growing your own food um, and repurposing materials. Um, so you can check out the rest of our um, previous recording, recordings on our website, which is earthday-365. Dot org or our YouTube, which is Earth Day 365. Um, we've got a couple other reduce, reuse, recycle programs as well as um, a handful of other programs. So if you all have questions tonight, um, feel free and pop them in the chat as Crystal is presenting um, and I will read them out to her at the end of the program. Um, so go ahead and pop them in there if you don't wanna forget your question. Um, thank you for being here, Crystal, take it away. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Crystal Stevens and thank you for having me. I'm with Flourish. My husband and I co-founded Flourish. It's a farm, a plant nursery. We do an apothecary and then we offer design and education. Uh, you can visit us at growcreateinspire.com and on Instagram and Facebook at growcreateinspire. Uh, we're also on the web with uh, Tend and Flourish School of Botanicals, which is, um, we do an herbal foundations program. And that was founded by Alex Quitham and I as a way of making herbal medicine accessible to all. So I don't have it listed here, but at Tend and Flourish School on Instagram and tendandflourishschool.com. I have a few books. Um, they're available at most local libraries. Your Edible Yard, Grow, Create, Inspire, and Worms at Work. And they're also available on my website if you're interested. And all of this information can be found in the books. That's my family, Iris in the front, Kyan, and then my husband, Eric. Uh, our children have been into farming since they were little ones. Iris was born into farming, quite literally. <laughs> um, Similar to the stories you hear about the women in the fields giving birth and getting right back to work. It wasn't that extreme with me, but it was very close. There's little Iris at just three days old uh, that we still had to bring in the harvest because we ran a, a 200 person CSA at La Vista CSA farm. And then uh, that's her. I bribed her with ice cream and a few dollars to take a reenactment photo. And there's Kyan bringing in the heirloom harvest. So I have a lot of photos to get through and a lot of slides. Um, I want to give you as much information on gardening and creating an edible oasis in your own backyard as possible this evening. So if you do have any questions, just uh, pop them in the chat and we'll cover them all at the end. So one of the reasons why we want to grow our own food is to do our part to prevent more soil loss. It takes 500 years for 1.5 centimeters of topsoil to form. That's a lot of soil loss um, that we have been doing to the earth in the last, since the industrial revolution with monocultures and um, big ag and erosion and deforestation, all of these things are really hurting and, and uh, depleting the soil. So it's up to us as stewards of the earth to build healthy soil, use our focus on our handprints rather than our footprints. And that it, I believe that quote was Diego Futter. Um, so really focusing on uh, building healthy soil is a big part of what we can do as gardeners. And that actually is quite easy and affordable to do, simply add organic material. And I, I'll cover a lot of that. Um, as we all know, our um, world, world food um, production is very, it's causing so much detrimental practices to the earth. It's really depleting the soil, it's harming the waterways, 
uh, you know, putting all of these uh, carbon dioxide into the environment is really hurting the environment in a, uh, on a large scale. So focusing more on small scale agriculture, supporting local farmers, growing what you can is really going to help um, prevent a lot of this destruction to the earth. And a part of the reason why I got into this, when I was 13, I learned in school in my science class that um, cattle ranching was one of the number one causes of deforestation in the rainforests and in, in tropical and subtropical and tem even temperate forests as well. So I became vegetarian at age 13 and kind of went back and forth. But since age 13, I've spent 90% of my time uh, being vegetarian. And that's not for everyone. I'm not pushing that on anyone. It's a personal choice. But our world food production really does have some pretty uh, harmful impacts. A picture speaks for itself. This is Destiny and Jeremy and Iris picking peas at La Vista. And here's a conventional strawberry farm to the right. Which one would you rather have your children or grandchildren pick from or eat from? So this is organic on the left, not certified organic, but definitely grown or organically. And then with some other, this first part of the presentation is just talking about a lot of tips and, and why garden using sustainable methods or why garden using regenerative methods instead of conventional methods. Well, with intensive tillage, the roots reach a hard pan, and that's due to compaction of the soil from over tillage. And then with long-term no-till, there's this beautiful network of biopores that can allow water to filtrate through the soil, that can allow the microbes to have a really comfortable ecosystem to live in, and the roots grow deeper, in the which creates stronger plants. So what can we do? One practical solution is to build soil organic matter through compost, vermicompost, sheet mulching, and building raised beds. Building raised beds and sheet mulching um, can be done on a budget using reclaimed materials, and so can compost and vermicompost as well. So those are the, the four main things that I'm going to be covering throughout this, and I'll tell you different, uh, my favorite plants and uh, different groupings of plants to grow as well. A lot of our methods over time have been adopted through permaculture, which is perma permanent agriculture or permanent culture. And those ethics are care for the land, care for the people, and return the surplus or reinvest the surplus. So earth care, people care, fair shares is another way to, to look at the ethics. And it really is um, a beautiful design process that looks at the big picture and how can we regenerate the earth rather than keep destroying it. Uh, a lot of other aspects of our work includes soil health. So we do a lot of research on Elaine Ingham's The Soil Food Web, looking at how of all of these key players in the soil wor are working in symbiosis to create this beautiful, rich, healthy soil. The Soil Food Web focuses on everything beneath the layer of the soil and right above it within the first few inches. And oftentimes it uh, relates to the trees as well and the mycorrhizal relationship with the fungus and the trees. So if you have a moment, you can um, check out this video, which is called What is the Soil Food Web on YouTube. It's a very informative video if you're interested in soil ecology, soil, um, looking at the soil in the through a microscopic level. So we focus primarily on soil renewal here at the farm, at Flourish Farm. We like to look at nature as a model. So no one ever had to go out and uh, fertilize an old growth forest. Nature is this beautiful representation of what's happening, how new life comes to be. The leaves fall in the fall, they um, scatter the mycorrhizal, uh, fungi comes in and, and takes over the forest floor and the decomposers come to play. So it's a really beautiful relationship to witness how seeds sprout and how things come to life in, in a forest. So using that as a model to, our, to mimic in our gardens is a, is a beautiful process. So compost bins um, can be recreated 
created with a number of free resources, including reclaimed lumber. There's uh, pallets that can be used, any, anything that you want. There's really a, one of the best parts of gardening is compost. So it's diverting food waste from the landfill. It's helping to build healthy soils. It's fertilizing and free food for your gardens. And so you can see some of these graphics or by this graphic, some of the statistics are pretty important with, with compost. You could even, if you have a small community garden or a small farm or even a, a large garden, you could become a compost drop-off site. So that's another way to get free resources. You're getting free food scraps from people just wanting a place to drop their compost. If you have it accessible with a driveway, really accessible driveway, that could be a, one way they can do that. Um, there are a lot of compost pickup um, services as well. Carondelet Park, Heeman Park, they all have compost, free compost for anyone who wants it as well. So looking at your uh, resources nearby is a great place to start. Uh, vermiculture is the use of worms to break down that organic material. It's a simple way of turning table scraps into compost and ho you're hosting an environment for worm reproduction. So vermiculture is worm farming and it's usually done with red wriggler worms. Uh, some people say red wrigglers, some people say red wiggler worms. They are the red worms that are good for composting. There are uh, earthworms that can be detrimental to ecosystems. So be sure you're getting composting worms if you if you do a mail order for worms. So we go with Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. That's a reputable source. That's how we get our worms to start the worm bins. So focusing again on uh, building healthy soil using nature as a, a model. Ideal gardens are composed of the following materials, detritus materials, um, leaves, fallen leaves, grass clippings, food waste, eggshells, coffee grounds, anything like that. Um, straw is a wonderful resource. Um, typically you can get free straw bales after big events, like after the pumpkin patch closes down for the Halloween season, you can get free straw bales. If there's a corn maze somewhere, they usually decorate it with it um, and people give the straw bales away. But lately there haven't been uh, big events happening. So a straw is about $8 per bale in the city, sometimes $10 per straw bale. And the sh there is a difference between straw and hay. Hay has tons of weed seeds in it. Straw is wheat straw, and that's a good one for the garden. It's, it's acts as if those wheats do sprout, they act as a cover crop and you can just chop them down or pull them out, they're easy to pull. So definitely get straw bales versus hay. Hay comes in the round bales and straw comes in the square rectangular bales. And we have always found that healthier soil equals higher yields. Uh, when we did big row farming with, uh, tra with tractors and tractor implements. We did a lot of tilling, but we replenished the soil with cover crops. And we also um, didn't till that much or that deep down. We, we tilled a lot in terms of getting the crops in and out of the farm, but then we replenished it with a cover crop. And then we, what we also did was took vermicompost and put it in each little hole when we went to plant with the tractor implements. So it, help to bring those microbes back to the soil. So if you can guess there, those look like lemon seeds, but they're actually little worm cocoons. So each little yellow, it looks like a little bead or seed has about three to six baby worms in it, those red regular worms. And you can see just how many are in this one. This is a little compact because it was after a heavy rain, but I just found it so fascinating how many worms were actually in there even in the layer that had already been, um, you know, broken down. So the ideal garden soil is composed of the ongoing layers of stems and twigs, fallen leaves, grass clippings, compost, worm castings, aged sawdust, untreated, of course, living organisms, those are the microbes, the healthy um, bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, um, fruit and vegetable scraps, and then other organic matter. So this is what we kind of focus on in our own garden beds is kind of the lasagna guarding or sheet mulching method. 
we do wet newspaper or cardboard on the bottom to suppress the weeds. And then we go up and build up from there. And we don't add every single thing on this list every single time, uh, but we do try to add at least four to five different layers in addition to some compost and to inoculate the uh, garden bed. Regular compost piles, you can compost pretty much anything um, like bones and meat and dairy, uh, but it will attract wildlife like raccoons and possums. So if you're in the city and you don't want wildlife coming to your garden, you might want to avoid composting the meat or dairy, but out in the country, we can compost a lot, which is where we live. Um, for, for worm composting, you don't want to do bones or anything hot or acidic like hot pepper, citrus. They just tend to uh, stay away from it and they don't break it down. So here's a few cheap ways to build compost bins. This one is a wire fence cylinder compost bin and you can just get this chicken wire or you can use um, paneling. Anything that is sturdy enough that won't blow away and if it is if you don't have a sturdy material, you can always reinforce it with garden stakes as well. So you can just fill it. This is a great time to start one of these composting bins. And you would want to stake it into the ground just a few in a few spots to make sure it doesn't blow away. But you start putting leaves, grass clippings, um, food scraps, coffee grounds, anything that your heart desires in that bin. And then by the spring, you could actually lift that whole thing up. And an instant garden bed is placed uh, right there. If you wanted to take a step further and make sure there's no weeds in your garden, you could actually layer two big layers of cardboard, like from a bike shop or an appliance shop, two big layers of cardboard on the bottom of the wire fence cylinder bin. Um, and then when you lift that up in the springtime, it's ready to plant in. So you can shape it however you'd like. You can keep it in a circle or make it in a square with a wooden border, however you'd like to do it. And then this is a basic cube compost bin made with pallets. If you're getting free pallets, I would make sure to look for a stamp that says HT. That means heat treated. If they're not heat treated, they're probably treated with formaldehyde or another chemical that preserves their longevity, which is not good for vermicomposting. And really, I don't, wouldn't want that leaching into my garden either. Then this, you can go a step further and make a trap door for uh, the vermicompost bin so that you can easily harvest the worm castings at the bottom. So this is a standard compost bin that you can do a lot of stuff in. This is a vermicompost bin where you wouldn't want to add the citrus or the onions or anything that they won't break down, like no bones. Um, and then the trap door, again, you can lift those slats up and help. I will help you put a shovel or a spade in easily and then harvest those worm castings. And a lot of people are scared to hurt the worms when they're harvesting the castings. I have found that it's very useful to put uh, half of a hollowed out watermelon the night before you're going to harvest the castings and they all get inside that watermelon. So, Typically, they're all inside like a little bowl of spaghetti. Here's some fun examples of way, ways to have closed loop systems where you can have rainwater catchment and it's um, coming off of your gutters, off of the roof of your house. The rainwater is collected with a hose. You would probably have to have a pump to get it to go to where you need it. Um, but you could have an outdoor sink that where you wash your veggies from the garden. And when that water drips down in the bucket, you can then pour it over the, the vermicompost bin. Um, if you do this, you would want to have one um, bucket or bin with holes at the bottom. So you don't want the worms to drown. So the basically the bottom one would be like a catchment and the top one would be where the worms are. And you, they won't drown because there's enough material in there to where you slow, slowly pour the water. And then what's collected at the end is not actually worm tea, it's called leachate. But I have a friend who has been using leachate to water her crops for years and she has 12 foot tomatoes. So um, some kept, you know, um, soil scientists would say, or even chemistry people would say, um, 
or biologists would would say not to use the leachate because there could be harmful bacteria. But if you know exactly what's in your bin, then you should be good. And as long as it's an aerobic environment, not an anaerobic environment, it should be good to use. Here's another example. This could be used in a raised bed garden. So if you're starting out and you have a raised bed, just one single raised bed, this tower, this worm tower could be very beneficial. Or let's say you don't wanna build a compost system you could build a worm tower and basically you're putting your food scraps into there with, with a handful of worms to inoculate it. And they're getting in and out of there, fertilizing your garden bed for you for free. You don't have to fertilize it. They're doing all the work for you and your crops grow big and strong and healthy. And that works for school gardens very nicely as well. And then in permaculture, this is called stacking functions where you can have uh, multiple yields from one thing. So this is a rabbit hutch where the rabbit is, you know, going to the bathroom and it falls down and you can put the worm, the worms mixed in with compost with the rabbit manure and that turns into really nutrient rich fertilizer for your garden. And meanwhile, you can use the rooftop to grow seedlings. Usually seedlings, um, we start seedlings outdoor on outdoors on tables under shades, excuse me, under shade trees, usually around Memorial Day. So you don't have to have a greenhouse after the weather gets really nice. Um, this is an adult redworm. Uh, it has um, five hearts, which is really fascinating. And it has these segments which help it to move in the cilia. And then they actually um, are very sensitive to light and they don't have eyes. They just go, they move through the soil uh, with, the, with the cilia, with the feelers. They can double their population every 90 days. So one pound could double every 90 days. So you could have a lot of worms on your hands and you can share them and you know give them away as gifts. In fact, uh, one the first time we got into this, my son was about four years old and I told him I had a present coming in the mail for him and it came and he got a box and he opened it and was a bag of red wriggler worms. So I think he thought he was getting Legos, but he got uh, red worms. But he ended up naming them and helping us with the vermicompost and taking good care of them. Every day he wanted to go feed the worms. So it was really neat to see him turn into a little gardener. Um, so this is um, a segment about water, but I'm, I'm just gonna skip over this part. I'll talk a little bit about it. I don't think we have enough time to really cover it, but there's all of these drainage basins and the Mississippi Missouri drainage basin is a huge one. So the Mississippi River Valley, and you can see all of the, so the Missouri River watershed, the Mississippi and the Ohio and the Arkansas all feed into the Mississippi and Missouri drainage bin, basin, excuse me, and it goes down into the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see the different beautiful, this is a beautiful rendition of all the watersheds and the the, the way that the rivers flow and how they meander and how they go down into this drainage point. Well, uh, this is a neat video. If you Google search this um, Mississippi watershed, it just shows you how the water flows there. Well, the reason why I'm showing you this is because, let's go back. You see how it empties out at the Gulf of Mexico? That's called a dead zone. So because there's so much corn and soy and, and big ag and erosion and industrial um, compounds and big factories along the Mississippi River, it all leaches out down into the um, this dead zone, the basin drainage point. And that's where fish have been deprived of oxygen because there's just too much chemical uh, composition in the water to for fish to actually breathe. And then there's the red tides. So you can see a lot of it is from cities and runoff and rainwater or um, stormwater rain runoff, farms, factories along this river shed. And um, unfortunately, this is causing this to happen. So if you are ever at the ocean during a red tide zone, you will know that this is what happens. Thousands of fish, and I, I'm sorry to show you this, this is the video that I took when our family went 
on a to a family reunion, but the whole beachside was thousands of dead fish due to the runoff and the the red tide and the oxygen deprivation of the fish. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because it's very important to now more than ever for us and the environment to use organic practices and regenerative practices and to help prevent erosion and to help um, everyone in our family and community be more self-reliant so we can start focusing on local food communities. Um, one big aspect of this is, you know, keeping the rainwater, channeling the rainwater. So the Metropolitan Sewer District has Project Clear, which is trying to mitigate stormwater runoff. And so a lot of this, this is Matt Lebon's backyard, it's a rainwater catchment system where he catches the water from his roof, stores it in the tanks, and then waters his garden with it. This is not his garden, but this is another aspect of slowing the flow of water. So if you have a hillside that has a lot of erosion or a lot of runoff at the end of a, a big um, slope, you can slow the flow by planting natives, by terracing it, by adding rock features or rock walls to slow the flow. Okay, so I just had to get all that <laughs> out there before we could start the actual content of the presentation. So gardening on a budget, um, you can start with a basic garden bed, and this is another example of it. A basic garden bed using fallen leaves, or I'm sorry, fallen trees or logs as the border. You can do cardboard to prevent weeds, and then burlap sacks and chip mulch to um, add that mycelial lever, layer, as well as uh, suppress the weeds. So you can see there's a bottom cardboard layer to suppress the weeds, and then there's the chip mulch to help suppress the weeds even further, but also the chip mulch, add, chip mulch adds a mycelial layer to it as well, so the mycelium have somewhere to grow. And then you can get St. Louis compost delivered, um, or you can, Go pick it up. A truckload is, I believe, thirty dollars. You can get their garden deluxe blend, and it's a, um, it's just a very fine. There's there's a fine particle to it, and there's a wood chip particle, so it's mixed in. But it you can grow transplants in it. If you wanted to grow seeds in this bed, you would need a, a secondary layer of, like a compost um, potting mix slash topsoil. So a few bags of each would be sufficient. And those usually run about $3 a bag. It depends on where you go at Bayer's Garden Nursery in the city, they're a little cheaper. So you can also do um, braised beds with reclaimed lumber. Um, you can fill them with chip mulch and then fill them with topsoil and then compost on top. I really like to use mushroom compost. But if you have a a source for soil that's free of weed seeds, that's the most important thing. It should be a, um, a blend that's OMRI certified, which means that it's organically produced. Uh, that would be ideal. But really the most important thing is that if you're building a raised bed, you don't want a bunch of weeds growing in it. So you want a, a very nice potting blend or a, a compost blend. You can do uh, square foot gardening, and that helps as well to uh, maximize your bed square feet. If you have a large garden, you could consider doing permanent raised beds. So this was made with a bed shaper, which you can rent if you have a tractor or if you can rent a tractor implement. Um, my husband did all of ours by hand. He actually dug out the trenches and layered the soil with a, a flat shovel. And that took uh, several days, but we were able to get them done. This is not ours, this is at Earth Dance. I have pictures of ours peppered throughout this as well. Um, but you can see even after a heavy rain event, the beds stay intact. And then you have these swales, which help store the water as well. Now for weed suppression, uh, occultation helps. So the first step would be to make the raised beds using an implement or by hand. 
And then you can um, lay a big tarp over them. This would be at the perfect time to build your beds before the ground is frozen. And then to uh, tarp them for the winter, they still get moisture from below, um, but they do not get, the, the weeds are, start to germinate and then they die off. So you're preventing the weeds from growing first thing in the spring when the ground is, is thawed and ready to go. There's also occultation. I'm sorry, so this is occultation and solarization. So solarization uh, is done with a clear plastic tarp and it's done in the same manner. You start with the permanent raised beds and then you solarize it. And that basically it gets the weed seeds big enough to germinate, but then they die off from the sun. And then that creates weed free garden beds that you can have a, a really nice start in the spring. Now you will still have weed pressure, but you can maintain it way easily as, if you get your seeds in there first and then keep on the weeding. You can go a step further if you build the raised beds and then you put this biodegradable plastic chip uh, sheet mulch on it. It's like a plastic mulch layer, but it's biodegradable. Um, I don't like putting plastic in the soil, but it is very, very, um, successful. And then you could do chip, um, chip mulch or burlap pathways covered with fallen leaves. This is just leaf litter from landscapers. That's the before and the after. So not a weed in sight and it's very, very successful, but you do have to put that black plastic um, biodegradable mulch on it. You could add fruit trees, Okay, so we'll get into resources for building healthy soil. Cover crops are an affordable way to regenerate your soil, to um, break up a hard pan. So if it's a soil that has been compacted over time or tilled a lot, or if it's a cornfield that's on a one acre plot by your, by your garden, you can help break up the soil hard pan by planting cover crops. So it does require typically an initial till uh, and then you would scatter the seed and they would grow up. And then it, each seed has its own method of like some are winter kill, some you have to use a crimper to kill, but then they feed the soil. Red clover is a good one. Red clover can still be grown right now. It, it is a winter cover crop. So it um, sets roots in the winter and then it starts to leaf out and bloom in the spring. Hairy vetch is not also a really good one, nitrogen fixing. That's the hairy vetch flowers. Uh, other resources for building healthy soil are leaf litter. So leaf litter works really well. So again, um, the landscapers could drop leaf litter off to your garden if you have a nice driveway that's accessible. My husband and I used to go on dates at 4 a.m. Most couples in their 20s were getting home at 4 a.m. We were getting a good night's rest, going to bed at 8, 8 p.m. and getting up at 4 a.m. and driving around looking for people's lawn bags filled with leaves so we can scatter them in our garden. You could also have stockpiles of uh, St. Louis compost. So if you have a pickup truck or have a friend with a pickup truck, you could go get a truckload for $35 and you could just keep adding soil to your garden year after year. You can have big piles of chip mulch. And if you have a large tractor um, by any chance, we still don't own a tractor and we've been farming for over a decade. So it's okay if you don't. Um, we've been using other people's tractors for a, a long time, but do not currently use one. So you could um, make your own giant compost windrows, it's called a windrow, by turning the, all of these organic materials together. Another free resource is, oh, so the chip mulch is a, also a free resource. So you can actually uh, get a hold of your local tree trimming companies and ask them to deliver the chip mulch directly to your garden. Sometimes you just give them a tip. Sometimes they charge, sometimes uh, they don't. It's, it depends on who you ask. So anytime we see anyone doing tree training work near their power lines, we give them our card and we ask if they could come and deliver it to our home. And they usually 
have to pay to drop it off at other places. So sometimes they'll want to save the money and time driving way out to a different location to drop it. When they're right down the road, they could just drop it in your, your driveway. Another free resource is uh, burlap sacks from Renoco. So every Friday, Renoco, they used to, I'm not sure if they still do with COVID, but they used to drop off a big pallet in the back of their warehouse um, full of burlap sacks on Fridays. I'm not sure if they still do it, but some coffee roasters will give them to you for free. I know one in the city on the hill was charging $5 per bur burlap bag, and that's outrageous. But burlap sacks can be used for sheet mulching. So if you don't want to use cardboard, you can use burlap or you can use cardboard and burlap to make sure you don't have weed pressure. So you can, mainly it's for sheet mulching your pathways. One of the major things with gardens is that there's a lot of weeding your pathways. So you can have a weed-free pathway if you simply put burlap, then cardboard, then chip mulch. And then you would want to keep building healthy soil in your actual garden beds. Here's just some examples of different things going on in the garden. So here's an example at Earth Dance, their herb garden. Um, all free resources with the um, logs surrounding the garden beds, the chip mulch pathways and burlap under the chip mulch and cardboard under the burlap. So a layer of cardboard, then burlap, then chip mulch for the pathways. And then the um, garden beds were filled with handmade uh, compost using the tractor, mixing over time chip mulch, fallen leaves, grass clippings, and food waste. And those were just kept, uh, you kept scooping them and scooping them and turning the piles. And eventually they decompose and if you add mycelium like oyster mushrooms or other mushroom spawn, you can speed up the process quicker. And if you add worms, you can speed up the process quicker, but using a tractor and having worms is, is quite difficult because you're killing a lot of the worms as you're moving the, them with a sharp blade of the tractor. Here's another example of using free resources. So you could build, if you have a terrace or if you just want one nice big long uh, garden bed, or if you want to do a food forest, a linear food forest, you can start with a hugel culture bed. So you can see here, we um, added some soil, then dug a trench, then added fallen sticks, branches, and twigs into the trench, and then covered it all with straw, glass, um, straw grass clippings, pine needles, uh, fallen leaves, and tiny twigs. And then we also added food waste. And that was a way to, in the fall, collect all those free resources, make a big, huge garden bed. And in the spring, it's ready to plant. And we actually installed a pollinator garden there. Then there's uh, backyard chickens could help fertilize your soil. So it's a, one chicken has many yields. It could provide, you know, uh, scratching. So it removes the grass from an area fertilizing so it poops in the area you might want to put a garden. Um, and then it also uh, eats a lot of the insects, the grubs, the um, uh, snails. If you have a slug problem, you might have a duck shortage or a snail or a chicken shortage. That's a Bill Mollison quote. And then it also uh, eliminates like the cabbage looper worms, if you let it go through the rows when it's cabbage looper season or stink bug season or shield bug season, uh, they'll eat insects and then they'll also produce eggs. So lots of lots of yields from chickens. This is uh, an example of some free resources. We built this garden shed with 100% free resources. Someone was dismantling a fence in their backyard and so we went and got it and then we just used recycled plastic from the previous greenhouse and um, created the whole thing using reclaimed materials. And then we added on a chicken run because here along the Mississippi River, the chickens were getting eaten by hawks and eagles. So we had to fence them in. So we have a movable coop that we move around the garden and then we have 
uh, the chicken run. We do let them free range if we are working in the garden, but typically the, the hawks, the owls will perch right by them. And then of course, uh, plant a wide variety of plants that serve a purpose in the garden, really focusing on biodiversity. There's uh, concepts that you can adopt, like for instance, a food, gar a food forest or an edible forest garden. The goal is to have as much uh, harvesting in the garden as possible throughout each season. So you can have um, a wonderful food forest layer that has uh, a canopy tree. So you could do a fruit tree, a tall fruit tree. That's number one. Number two would be an understory tree or a sub canopy large shrub like a June berry. So you could have an Asian pear as number one and a June berry as number two. Uh, Asian pears are very prolific, disease resistant, pest resistant. June berries are very abundant, like up to a thousand berries on one tree after the third year. And you can have shrubs and they could be edible shrubs, um, an herbaceous layer with lots of different herbs, medicinals, pollinator attractors. You could even have perennial fruits and vegetables in there. And then ground cover or creeping layer, uh, one good one for that would be strawberries or even a red clover. And then there's the underground layer, which is like the roots or the mushrooms, the mycelial network. And then number seven would be the vertical climber. And so we'll start with this one. This is a vertical climber, passion flower, passion fruit. These are actually the passion fruits. Here's a, a more illustrated version of the food forest garden or fruit tree guild. You can have a guild planting with lots of different things going on. Here's a, a guild with, just to put it into real life perspective, with a peach tree, elderberries, uh, sage, there's lemon balm, strawberries at the base. Here's another guild with pawpaws, elderberries, uh, echinacea, there's a apple tree and a pear tree in the background as well. Here's one with a Siberi Siberian pea shrub, which is a nitrogen fixer with elderberry and yarrow. And then we've got, um, here's, I'm just gonna go through these real quick. We don't have very much time left and I wanna save some time at the end for questions. So we have fruit trees, uh, Liberty apple and Asian pear are two really good producers in this region. We've got the red haven peach and the tart cherry, both excellent producers in this region. The June berries or the amelanchier, um, for a low tree layer. For a shrub layer, you could do elderberry, the canadensis variety, Sambucus canadensis. And I buy my elderberry starts from River Hills Harvest. Gumi, it's a nitrogen fixing fruiting shrub, which is very wonderful. It's filled with antioxidants and it's loaded with fruit. See how many hundreds of berries are on one shrub. We've got Nanking cherries which are a spring bloomer and a summer producer, late or early summer producer. Aronia berries, which is a shrub, very amazing, super antioxidant rich. Got herbaceous layer. That, so these are the dynamic accumulators. So comfrey takes nutrients from the soil and makes it bioavailable in its leaves. So it's a chop and drop. So when you cut that, you can just cut the plant itself at the base of the the base of the soil and chop the entire thing and then fertilize our fruit tree. So you put it all around the fruit tree and just leave it as a sheet mulch layer and it helps to fertilize fruit trees. Then we've got nitrogen fixers, which are some Missouri natives, Baptisia, blue false indigo and lead plant. Medicinals, we've got um, purple coneflower, echinacea and bee balm, both very excellent for cold and flu season. Um, purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, or Angustifolia are both very excellent medicinals. They're also pollinator attractors and Missouri natives. Then we've got passion flower, which Incarnata is actually a, a native species, wonderful medicinal, as well as an amazing pollinator attractor. It attracts a lot of bumblebees. 
And then there's some non-natives in here as well. So lemon balm, anise, hyssop, these are all great herbaceous layer plants that you can plant to serve multiple purposes for medicine and for uh, pollinator attractors. So we've got anise hyssop, witch hazel, which is the first bloomer in the winter, yarrow, excellent um, um, pollinator attractor, very amazing medicinal. And then New England aster, a Missouri native, self heal, which is Prunella vulgaris, also a, a Missouri native, and it's very medicinal. Stinging nettles, lavender. You could have so many things in this under, so many plants in this understory. Um, St. John's wort is one of my favorite Missouri natives, very medicinal. All these are wonderful medicinal plants. Mullen, also a Missouri native. Calendula is not native, but it's beautiful and annual. Then you can have your culinary herbs and your alliums, garlic chives, uh, Egyptian walking onions. Those are Egyptian walking onions. The alliums help to deter pests and to um, keep unwanted insects away, but they're also pollinator attractors for beneficials. And then you could plant garlic as well. So you're planting all of these various things in a, I'll go back to the original slide, excuse me for the delay. Here we are. So again, this is a fruit tree guild. So the reason I'm talking about so many different things at once, it's I'm just giving you possibilities and options to plant in a guild. So all of these guild plants serve different purposes. So the canopy layer, the understory layer, you just have as many layers as you possibly can to maximize the space of your garden to, you know, to get as many plants as you can in with minimal weed pressure. The more plants you have, the more they're creating these network of biopores, which is allowing water to store at the root layers. And then you can uh, just have a, an abundant garden. So I think I'll end it there with, with that slide. And uh, I have, I think, 50 more slides, but we don't have time for that. So does anyone have any questions? Thanks so much for coming on, Crystal. Um, I'll give people a minute to put stuff in the, in the chat if they do. I have a compost question. Yes. Uh, we have a very... DIY compost bin uh, in the in our our backyard um, in a little tiny section um, and I just thought about maybe it needs to be covered for the winter to keep heat in thoughts Do about that worms? like no it's just um, like wood panels and then I'm just putting food scraps and carbon thing which is things which have mostly been brown bags because we live in a duplex and I don't do yard work here. So, um, but then- I've, I've never covered my compost bin. Okay. The only reason I would cover it is if there's worms in there and you don't want the raccoons to eat the worms, um, which there might be worms if, if you're- Yeah, there's probably worms, bin. but I didn't put them there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, uh, I usually let the elements get into the compost bin. Um, you know, sometimes I left it open, sometimes I closed it. If there was going to be three feet of snow, I usually put a cover on it just to protect the worms. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We'll think about covers. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Bob, do you have any tips for storing the harvest so as not to waste the food I grow? Sure, so I like fermentation and freezing. Canning can be a bit daunting and expensive, so I prefer, I know plastic is not something we all wanna use, but Ziploc bags, freezer bags, is what I store a lot of fresh chopped up vegetables. So as I'm preparing a meal in the peak of the season, I'll just chop a few extra peppers and put them in Ziploc bags, or chop a few extra tomatoes and save them for a rainy day. Um, for, and then I like to ferment a lot. So fermentation, lacto fermentation, just chopping things up and pouring salt water brine over them 
and I leave them out on the counter for a couple of days and then refrigerate them. And you can have a nice probiotic pickle, which is pretty much what, what it tastes like when it's fermented. Okay, um, I'll give people a little bit more time. I did want to say thank you again to our sponsors, um, the St. Solid Waste Management District of St. Louis Jefferson County and Missouri DNR, um, Department of Natural Resources. Um, and tomorrow you all can join us. Um, our program manager of the Green Dining Alliance, Victoria Donaldson, um, as well as other panelists will be doing climate conversation greenwashing um, through Washington University's climate change program. And I'll drop some of those links um, in, the ch in the chat. Bob has another question. Do you have any tips for, oh, no, he just said thanks. That was, got it. <laughs> that was my um, chat error. And then um, I also wanted to say that Giving Tuesday is coming up on December 1st, um, which is an important day for nonprofits to um, raise money and continue their mission. So um, if people can think about giving, donating on Giving Tuesday, um, we are going to be having our first Eco Media Club meeting. Um, so this, the Eco Media Club is gonna meet 10 times a year um, to discuss movies, books, um, articles, short videos, other media on environmental topics, which will actually be a membership perk. But the first two, so in this, on December 1st and then January are gonna be open to the public. So at 6.30, we'll be discussing Kiss the Ground, um, which is a documentary. And the discussion will be led by our young friends. Um, so you can watch it on your own on Netflix or you can join um, our watch party, which will be on Zoom from 5 to 6.30. And then that discussion will be um, 6.30 to 7.30. So I will put some of this stuff in here for you all. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, if you wanna come tomorrow night to see Victoria, um, that'd be great. Thank you also, Crystal, um, for being here and helping us garden on a budget and all of your beautiful photos. Um, it doesn't look like anyone else has questions, so I'll drop this in here really quickly and then let everyone get on their way. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, okay, there it is for everyone. Thank you, Crystal. Great information and beautiful photos. Thank you. And thank you, Bob. Good night. Good night.